Okay, so it's great pleasure to have uh, Alandra Adam today uh, from the University of British Columbia. And for those of you who are not sure what the conversation about Ottawa was, he is also the president of uh, NSERC, Natural Sciences Engineering Research Council of Canada. And uh, we will hear about three finite group actions on rational homology spheres. So thank you very much. Uh, you can go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure. Always a pleasure to visit uh, Turkey, uh, even by Zoom, right? <laughs> and it's, a, it's a really a pleasure to, to see you all. Thank you for the invitation. So I'm going to talk about a, a few things about um, classical group actions on the rational homology spheres, and then on some uh, other spaces, uh, inspired by this on some uh, other spaces, uh, particular uh, rational homology four spheres uh, towards the end. So here's the plan. Uh, we're going to first apply methods from cohomology of groups to the problem. Uh, then we'll focus on actions which are trivial in homology. And we'll, we'll see an application uh, to uh, finite quotients of uh, fundamental groups of hyperbolic manifolds. And then uh, some musings about actions on 4N manifolds, which is uh, so we're more work in progress. And all this is joined with uh, Ian Hamilton, whom I know we, all of you know well because he's visited there a few times, right? Or at least once. Maybe. So, uh, so let, let me start out setting this up. And uh, it's going to be heavily cohomological because, well, that's, that's the way uh, this is, right? Okay. <laughs> uh, at least that's the approach that we're taking to this problem. So G is going to denote a finite group. I guess I can use this as a pointer. Yes, what I learned from my previous lecture. So it's going to be a finite group generally. So we're going to reserve G for finite. There will be some gammas later, which will possibly be infinite. And assume it's acting freely and smoothly on a three manifold that is a rational homology sphere. Uh, that means that <clears throat> the rational uh, homology is the same as the rational homology of, uh, of the three sphere. So that means that the um, whatever doesn't appear at the top is going to be uh, torsion over the integers. Now, um, Cooper and Long proved that every finite group can act in this way. And I should say that this is in contrast to uh, the classical situation for, say, integral spheres, you know, the, uh, the big push of Smith theory and uh, then the work of Swan and others is to characterize groups that can act freely on spheres, integral, integral uh, homology spheres. So now uh, we're going to uh, express the situation in terms of representation theory. So I'm going to denote by omega r of z uh, the zg module. So uh, that's the group algebra, integral group algebra, which is defined in the stable category of modules as the r-fold dimension shift of the trivial module of z. So you take a, a free resolution of z and you take uh, the kernel at that stage and uh, you, you're taking a, a model for that. And there's a, a way of constructing that using <coughs> minimal resolutions. I won't get into that, but it's a, it's a module which is, we can define, um, if you want, up to projectives. So if a finite group G acts freely on a rational homology three-sphere M, so again, that's a, one of these smooth manifolds that has a rational homology of a three-sphere, then there is a short exact sequence of ZG modules in the stable category of ZG modules, which has the following form. So here you have H1 of MZ. Now this is going to be a torsion module. This is going to be a, a torsion-free module, and this kernel is going to be torsion-free. And there are going to be some projectives here, which are making this, uh, this uh, exact sequence in the, in the uh, stable modules. Uh, so that's telling you that from the point of view of cohomology, group cohomology, uh, this thing here is determined uh, as the difference between these two modules. And these two modules are related by some operation. Now, um, if you're not uh, too familiar with the group cohomology, it's good to try to make this uh, explicit and try to see how, how we put together uh, th these kinds of modules. And the nice thing is that this can be described functionally in terms of uh, the cup product with a cohomology class. So we'll move on to that next. Okay, so we have a stable map 
from uh, omega minus two of z to omega two of z. And this defines an element then, and this is in the stable category, so this is modular projectives, from omega minus two of z to omega two of z, which we can identify with uh, the uh, homomorphisms in this category from z to omega four of z. And this is isomorphic to h minus four of g the coefficients in Z. And this is the Tate cohomology. So uh, this is a way of describing the cohomology, Tate cohomology, in terms of uh, these minimal, the, these um, dimension shifts of the trivial module. And this is a cohomology in negative degrees. And that's what the hat means, right? The difference between a Tate cohomology and regular cohomology is that it is a uh, over the whole integers, not just the natural numbers. And uh, so it takes negative values, values in the negative numbers, indices. However, you can all, always think of this in terms of, uh, of uh, homology. So the, the, the negative Tate uh, cohomology is isomorphic to the positive uh, Tate homology. In particular, H minus four is isomorphic to H lower three of G with coefficient Z, the ordinary homology. So it's a nifty way of gluing together the cohomology and the homology. But the, the point for us is that the take cohomology, you can give it a product and think of it all at the same time. This is a very convenient theory. So uh, now this class appears when you're applying uh, take cohomology uh, to this sequence here. So, and then we'll see how that works. Uh, Alejandro, there's a, oh. there's a question in the chat, if you can see it. Oh, I can't see. Uh, so the question is, is a negative shift of omega related to injective hulls? Working over Z injectives and projectives are different. Well, but over ZG, right, you, you can use the injectives and projectives. You can embed things in projectives. You make them torsion free. You shift them to make them torsion free. Then you can shift them forward using the projective, right? So that's how, that's how you do it. So, so you okay. can take, I guess, a co-resolution. Okay. Now, uh, this, the Schrodinger sequence, uh, then you apply Tate cohomology, the Tate cohomology functor, and uh, what I've written down here is the long exact sequence associated to it. So, um, so here I is, is an arbitrary uh, index. This is the way the sequence looks. Now, how, how should we think of this? Well, this, uh, really what you're looking at is the kernel and the co-kernel of cup product by a particular uh, cohomology class. And what is this class? Well, let's take i equal to a minus two, then this will be h zero of g, and this will go to h minus four of g. And if we take the generator, th this is uh, well known to be isomorphic to the, to, uh, the integers uh, modulo the order of the group. And this integer, this generator will go to a certain class and that's sigma, and by the uh, multi Applicative structure, the module structure of the sequence, what you see is that this is uh, then just a cup product by this class. So that's, and here, this is our module, which appears in, in, in homology. So uh, two of these terms are allegedly known to us, which is the cohomology of the group of trivial coefficients, and this is the cohomology with twisted coefficients. So that's how uh, this uh, sits. So um, let's try to understand that. Then, uh, from the point of view of geometry, uh, people will be saying, well, that's a lot of gobbledygook, a lot of group cohomology. We came here to see geometry. After all, it is supposed to be a topology seminar. So uh, what's happening? So we'll say, well, how do we define, uh, how do I identify this class geometrically is the, is the first question. What does this have to do with uh, an action? Remember that we started out with an action on a, uh, uh, on a space and uh, on a rational homology three sphere, and we, we came up with this. So what does this have to do with the action? So uh, next result is to identify that um, geometrically. So, uh, so remember that um, M is a, is a closed manifold, it's orientable. And it has a, 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 an action of G. And we're assuming that this action uh, preserves or orientation. 
So uh, we're looking then at, uh, I, guess it, I guess it has to, to be a free action. So um, then we're, we're, uh, we're looking at this, this um, fellow over here. And uh, what is this? Well, we have a fundamental class here, okay? That just means the, the, the class which sits in there if you want by uh, the fact that it is a closed manifold of uh, a three-dimensional manifold and it's the quotient. And now we have a map from this orbit space to BG, which is called the classifying map. And that's a classifying map associated to the covering. So uh, what we have here is the following. If we take the fundamental class of the quotient manifold, then the, the cohomology class sigma is the image of this fundamental class, which now will sit in uh, H over three of BG, under the natural isomorphism, which identifies H3 of BG with H minus four of G, H minus four K of G, where this is the classifying map of the curve. So you take uh, M modulo G, map it to BG, that's a classifying map. So this is a vibration with a fiber M, sort of a classical uh, <coughs> from covering space theory. BG is a classifying space. The cohomology of BG is the same as the cohomology of G. So this gives you, from the action, you get a class in H lower three of G, and this is isomorphic to H minus four of G. So the algebra here, this algebra, and this looks very, like very algebraic uh, picture here, is actually coming from the geometry, which is what you would want to see. So it's, uh, it's uh, sorry, okay. so uh, that's where we're getting that. So, uh, so that's telling you one piece of the picture. So now you, you understand what happened here, and this is cup product with that, uh, that cohomology class. It's like a, a churn class associated to the action. Now, what about uh, this part over here? If I take in particular i equal to two, then I have a map from H zero of GZ, and I can do the same trick. I'll have the, the generator here, and this will map to some element in H two of G with coefficients in H one of M. So um, this, now we can try to identify that. So let's so remember that, that that mapping cohomology comes from a map from omega two of Z to H one of M, and that is going to define an extension class. I will write uh, epsilon m in H2 of G with coefficients in H1 of mz. So there's a, there's a, the, the tautological generator here, the H2 of G with coefficients in omega 2 of z, and because this is the, uh, like the universal uh, extension, uh, two-fold extension, and uh, that's being mapped to this, so that defines a class over here. And it's the image under, of, of the generator under the map, which we described there. So now um, it's telling you that the other piece of the, of the long Z sequence is identified in terms of a group extension. Now, generally speaking, cohomology of groups, uh, people feel sad when they encounter group cohomology because they don't know um, what it means. They don't understand it because it's uh, it can you know it's an invariant of a module. Who knows what it's measuring about a module? So it's, it's in general complicated. But they get very happy when they see H two because it's kind of a classical. Uh, it's uh, something which we know which has to do with uh, group extensions. So this is really uh, identifying certain isomorphism classes of group extensions, uh, where the kernel is going to be this abelian group, and this is going to be uh, the quotient. So we can make that precise. In fact, uh, sigma uh, uh, epsilon m is represented by the abelianized extension. So uh, you, you have an extension which goes from pi one of m mod g into g with a certain kernel, which is uh, pi one of m. If you abelianize that extension, you get this abelianized extension. So uh, the information from the long exact sequence is a balance between um, information about the uh, that churn class of the action and uh, the extension class. This is a class involving the abelianization of uh, the fundamental extension uh, for the, the extension for the fundamental group that arises from the 
from the cover or from the uh, classifying space construction. So anyway, the upshot of that is the following um, rather nice result. If G acts freely on a rational homology three sphere, then you have the following. The order of the group is equal to the exponent of sigma times the exponent of epsilon of n. So what is the, eps, uh, what is the exponent of a uh, cohomology class? Well, we're talking here about torsion modules. These are all a finite abelian groups. If you have uh, an element in a finite abelian group, it generates a cyclic subgroup, and the exponent is going to be the order of that cyclic subgroup. Okay, that's the ad hoc definition of the exponent of a cohomology class. And now what we're recording here, and this is a, a basic fact that comes from the sequence. You see, if you have a class here when i is equal to, uh, I guess, uh, equal to two, then this builds up a copy of, of, of z modulo the order of the group. So this, this, you get a cyclic group of order, the order of the group. Then its image over here is that extension class. And then the kernel here, what you have here is cup, cup product with the, um, you're cupping, uh, the image here of cupping from um, uh, H4. Uh, but that's just the Tate dual. You're taking the Tate dual and the Tate duality, it's mapping uh, in a non-singular way to this. So, uh, so it's what's saying is that the cyclic group, which is built here, is uh, its exponent, well, it fits into, into a little extension where the image is the, generated here by the epsilon m and the kernel here generated by a class which has the same exponent of, as uh, sigma. So uh, that is written down in this uh, corollary. So the order of the group is equal to that. So um, what do you uh, infer from that? Well then, uh, when is an element in the cohomology invertible, in the cohomology uh, ring? That's a question you, you ask. Well, only if it has um, the highest exponent. You know, that's the, uh, when you're looking at the cohomology of a finite group, and I realize this is a bit for experts, but I guess there are at least three of them, right? Certainly more. But the, um, uh, the, uh, we have an element in the cohomology, the trivial coefficients, that has the order, the order of the group, and that is an invertible element, and the cohomology of the group is periodic. That's just a, just, a, uh, anyway, that's a, one of the beautiful things about the cohomology of, of finite groups. So what we're saying here is that, well, this class here is gonna be invertible if and only if this class here is gonna be trivial. So that's, and that corresponds to the splitting of this extension. And in particular, if the order of the group is relatively prime to the order of this finite group, then this uh, sigma is gonna be invertible. So that's just recording facts that are well known for the group cohomologists. Now, if sigma is equal to zero, then epsilon m has exponent uh, equal to the order of the group, and that gives you a, a, a stable decomposition. I realized afterwards, as I was writing that, that the um, homotopy there is my object for that. But anyway, it's a, it's a, uh, it's an isomorphism up to projectives. And it turns out the thing on the right is a direct sum of those two modules. And uh, this will happen, of course, when the cohomology is zero and there's nothing there. And I want to give you an example where that happens. An example of a group where the first four cohomology groups are zero. For example, the Matthew group, M23. So it's a large and complicated group. But if, and we know it appears as the, uh, as the uh, but that acts on some rational homology three spheres. So it certainly exists in this universe. Uh, but then in that case, the H1 is going to be splitting. And this is stable because, of course, H1 of MZ is, is a torsion module, right? So you have to understand what that formula means. Uh, so M23 is the example. Now, uh, this H4 GZ being zero, how does it give you the minus four is being zero and the Tate cohomology. Because uh, by Tate duality, by Tate duality, H4 is isomorphic to H minus four. I see. Uh -huh. so, uh, 
so um, anyway, the, the, in general, I would say H1 of MZ is a very complicated object. It's very twisted. It's absorbing, you know, when you work on actions on spheres, there's really not enough homology to uh, support things beyond a projective, uh, a periodic group, free actions. But here, this little module is kind of absorbing. So it, it must be, you know, has a lot of action built into it that um, allows, that supports the action. So it's kind of mysterious to that. Uh, if someone could, could say more about H1 or MZ in general, that would be good. Uh, we're going to focus on the case of uh, when that module is trivial, when the action is trivial. But before doing that, I'll just mention there for the, those who like exponents, if you have an elementary abelian P group, then we know that uh, P annihilates uh, the non-zero Hague cohomology. And then you can see that the exponent of sigma M uh, has to be at least P to the R minus one. Because remember, you're building P to the R from a class of X1 and P and the exponent of another class. So that tells you that the, um, the, the H2 of, of G with coefficients in H1 of MZ has exponent at least P to the R minus one. So it had better have a lot of torsion in it. So, um, you know, you might want to think about the theory of modules that have higher torsion. That's an, that's an interesting uh, problem, to what, what you can say about the representation. But okay, I mean, we can say some things about their complexity, by the way, for those who are experts in that, but that's, uh, you know, you just leave it out there. Okay, so now we're gonna switch, being topologists, that's enough algebra, we wanna go back to something that we can maybe think we can understand, which is the case of actions which are trivial in homology. So uh, that means that the, um, the module, uh, homology module is now thought of as a module has an action which is trivial. So uh, it could be, a, it's a torsion module and the G action is trivial. So now this will impose some drastic restrictions. Uh, the first one is if G acts freely and homologically trivially on a rational homology free sphere, then every elementary B on of G has rank at most two. And that uh, I think comes, follows from the, um, from the uh, exponent uh, uh, thing, because uh, obviously in, you're not gonna be able to get this, uh, this uh, higher stuff, right? So you can only get P squared occurring. So now what should be the canonical example for you to think about? So folks who don't know about the group actions, right now you're saying, well, this is very abstract, Give us an example. So uh, if you take um, the three sphere, there's an action of the quaternion group of order eight on the three sphere. The quaternion group of order eight is uh, a subgroup of the three sphere, thinking of the three sphere as the, the unit, to the, the continuous unit uh, quaternions. So um, we can divide out by the central Z mod two in, in uh, the quaternions. And uh, what remains is an action of Z2 cross Z2 on the quotient of S3 by this uh, action of Z2, that central Z2, and that gives us RP3. So there's an action of Z3, Z2 cross Z2 on RP3 uh, coming from this free action on the three sphere. And uh, you have then a, uh, associated to that, what we're really using is this central extension. Okay? So this piece acts freely on the three sphere, then you get a free action on the remaining piece on RP3. So the fact that these a real projective space, when the dimension is congruent to three mod four, and that's very important here, uh, gives us uh, a free action of Z2 cross Z2. Uh, now it turns out that all groups acting freely, homologically, truly on rational homology spheres can be modeled in this way. Uh, and that's one of the uh, theorems we have. So, um, let me state it here. Let G denote a finite group acting freely and homologically trivially on the rational homology three sphere, M. And let pi uh, be, be the product of precisely those primes which divide both the order of the group and the order of H1 of MZ. So remember, this is just a finite uh, abelian group. Then uh, there exists an extension. So the here the quotient is G, here's an H, we call it Q pi, where H is the H1 of MZ at, uh, at pi, if you want the product of the components corresponding to these primes. And this is a central cyclic subgroup 
and QPI is a group with periodic cohomology of period two or four. So it's a uh, it's a uh, a description of the um, of what these groups have to look like. And uh, a corollary of that is the following: uh, a finite p group G acts freely and homologically trivially on some rational homology P sphere M with non-trivial P torsion in its H1, if and only if one G is cyclic, or for P equals two, H1 of MZ at two is the isomorphic to Z mod two, and G is a dihedral group. So of course, so for P groups, we have a very good understanding of what these look like. So, so here we only care about those primes which intersect, which appear for both the order of G and in that kernel. Those are the ones that really get entangled. There are these other pieces which really um, don't, uh, don't, don't play a role in this. So that's a, 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 a nice uh, satisfactory description of what these groups have to look like. Now, uh, you could ask um, about, um, well, let me just continue here, and then we'll, we'll talk a bit about existence of actions. So again, a corollary, these are just corollaries of, of, of the form of the theorem, that G act freely and homologically truly in a rational homology three sphere. If both the order of the group and the order of H1 are even, then the CELO2 subgroup group is either cyclic or dihedral. Again, that comes from the extension data. If P is an odd prime dividing the order of the group, then the P CELO subgroup is cyclic. And if the order of the group is prime to P, then the P CELO subgroup is either cyclic or generalized quaternion. So that's just an analysis of what the groups have to look like. Uh, now, you might ask the same question for, uh, anyway, oh, so just to summarize, we're in very good shape here because, because of, of our result. We can say things about the, uh, about the extension, right? That's the key fact that we can say something about the extension, and we can also say something about the churn class. Right? So you say you're playing off periodicity and splitting of the extension and how those are built together. That's really what this theorem is, is explaining uh, from the point of view of group theory. Now, you could consider the same kind of problem for higher dimensional or rational homology spheres. So say I give you the five the dimensional rational homology sphere. It's true that every group will act freely on some rational homology five sphere or seven sphere, that's been done by, I guess, high dimensional surgery. So all those are taken care of. Maybe that's in a paper of May Browder and Shang. I don't remember exactly how it appears. So, um, so you can try to understand that problem. Now you'll have a whole family of modules. Uh, and uh, you, you might ask, you know, there'll be like an H1, an H2, how do those connect or not? So there's a whole, a whole interesting problem there. Now, if you use the exponents, you can show that if G acts freely and homologically trivially on a simply connected rational homology and sphere, then the rank of G can be at most um, N minus two. I guess that should be, uh, oh, simply connected, yeah. That should be N minus two. So um, that's just counting the number of, 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 uh, of homology groups. So anyway, that's an interesting general problem, which I think is kind of mysterious and perhaps to say much about. I'll pose it to you guys. Now, now suppose that you have a finite group with periodic uh, cohomology of period four. Does G act freely and homologically trivially on some rational homology three sphere? So that's a uh, very particular question that uh, you might want to ask. Now, we have a complete list of such groups, which is provided by Milner. And those that can act freely and orthogonally on S3 were listed before that by Hoff. It was uh, spherical space forms as listed by Hoff. Now, Perelman showed that the remaining groups in Miller's list do not arise as a fundamental group of any closed oriented three manifold. And that, uh, some work with Ronnie Lee on that also before that. So, for those with quaternion two pseudo subgroups, we have a non existence result in our setting. So, the result over the integers is much studied, and there's an understanding, of course, because of. of um, Perlman's resolution of, of um, the Poincaré conjecture, you understand which ones uh, arise, gives you the three sphere as it covers. Right? So uh, we have the following non existence result. That G be a finite group of period four, which acts freely in homology truly in a rational homology three sphere, then either uh, one, G is a quotient of a finite three manifold group by a central cyclic subgroup, 
or two, the two Cedo subgroup of G is quaternion of order E. So um, there's the situation, of course, with this uh, cyclic group acting centrally. And you just divide up by that. And but the other one is that you have a quaternion group of order E. So that's a restriction that, that appears there. Now we can show that the quotient examples in part one include periodic groups of non-central elements of order two, which is impossible for groups acting freely on any sphere by Milner's classical result. So those do not act on the sphere itself by that in the classical result of Milner, that if a group acts freely on, on, um, on a sphere, then, then um, the involutions uh, have to be central. And uh, in part two is established by ruling out the groups with larger quaternion uh, two serial circles in Milner's list. And, uh, and I just to mention here that the result rules out all quotients of these groups by central cyclic structures. So here's an example of a, of a non existence uh, result. Okay. So, um, so now uh, what we're going to do is apply this to uh, quotients of um, fundamental groups of hyperbolic manifolds. So uh, again, again, let's consider closed three manifolds with finite coverings, which are rational homology spheres. And we saw that the associated finite covering groups act freely on rational homology three spheres. So they afford examples to which our methods will apply, right? So now we're thinking if the covering is a rational homology sphere and, and you have a finite downstairs, so you can apply this result. Now, every finite group, in fact, acts freely on some hyperbolic uh, closed rational homology sphere. So you can refine that result to tell you that it's uh, on a hyperbolic. So a spherical here means that the uh, higher homotopy groups are all zero, but it's really a K pi one. So in those cases, pi one determines a topology, and you're really just considering uh, these finite index subgroups of concrete duality groups with vanishing first pairing. Now, for any group uh, an integer, n greater than equal to zero, you define the nth term of this derived series in the most traditional way as a commutator of the nth term. And this derived series for a finite group stabilizes at a perfect normal subgroup, but may not terminate for an infinite group. So there's the following open question that the derived series for the fundamental group of a closed orientable three manifold stabilize if the quotient gamma mod gamma n is finite for all n. If so, gamma mod gamma i is a soluble group with periodic cohomology for previous dividing form. Now, if uh, L is a closed hyperbolic three manifold, such that for some n greater than zero, the quotient of pi one of L or the nth stage pi one of L is finite. Now, we take gamma equal to pi one of L, and then you consider these extensions here, so you relate these guys, they're related by extension like this, for, uh, for i between 0 and n minus 1, then you infer that these groups are finite in that range, and hence the corresponding covering spaces Li are rational homology spheres. And the finite groups, gamma and gamma i, act freely on them with quotient L. And note that h2 of Li z is just this, this quotient here. Right? So then we're really expressing the data about these extensions of these infinite groups in terms of, of uh, invariants that we can identify using our previous result. So now uh, we can say it like this. So suppose you have now the fundamental group of something of this L called gamma, such that these uh, quotients are finite. So this is finite for some n greater than zero. Then uh, for n, all the integers up to n minus one, you have these long exact sequences. And these sequences are determined by element sigma i in h minus four of these uh, quotients. And these are images of the generators in h zero. Again, uh, again, just an application of our result. And here are these classes. And in particular, if uh, these orders are co-prime, then sigma i is an invertible element in the cohomology. So uh, it's a kind of fascinating uh, um, study of, of these groups. Uh, I want to mention that our approach can be used to prove some uh, prior results fairly directly once you're in the world of Tate cohomology and those things. So here's a result that was proved by Cavendish, 2015. Suppose you have a closed hyperbolic three manifold and Q a surjective homomorphism 
from its fundamental group onto a finite group G, which induces an isomorphism. So you have this infinite, this closed hyperbolic three manifold, and then it's a, in this group here, a, this is the fundamental group mapping onto G, and suppose it induces an isomorphism of the abelianizations. So we're assuming here that you have a finite, uh, its abelianization is finite, and such that the kernel is contained in the second uh, uh, iteration of this derived series. Then uh, phi from H2 of GC to H minus 2 of GZ, given by a cupping by sigma, where sigma is determined by the fundamental class as before, right? this is the H, the, the class of min minus 4, is an isomorphism, and cup product defines a non degenerate pairing between H2 of GZ, H2 of GZ to H4 of GZ. And this pairing factors through a cyclic subgroup of H4 of GZ. So um, this is a uh, kind of a, a very, you would say, delicate kind of uh, a statement based on the, um, kind of all these cohomological facts being brought together. Now, this gives you as a corollary the following result due to Resnikov. Then L be a closed three manifold such that G is a two group. G, this is pi one of L, along with the nth stage of the derived series, is a two group. And H one of LZ is uh, isomorphic to Z2 plus Z2. Then G is a generalized quaternion group. So you might wonder why is this true? So just think about it. So Resnikov yeah, proved this theorem, of course, using. I guess he used things about, uh, you know, uh, maybe other techniques, you know, but uh, let's think of it from our point of view. G is a generalized quaternion group. What can we say about that? Well, G is a quotient of pi one of L mapping onto its abelianization. So uh, G uh, modulo its commutator is also Z2 plus Z2. So G is what they call a two group of maximal class. And thus, you know, it must be either generalized quaternion dihedral or semi-dihedral. This comes from the uh, classification of, uh, of two groups. However, the condition that the cup product Perry be non-singular eliminates the semi-dihedral groups. And the fact that the image has rank one eliminates the dihedral groups. So you conclude that G is a generalized uh, quaternion group. So that's how, the, um, that's how you prove that, that result. So it really uses all these little pieces which come as this result. So, uh, you know, that, that's the application. There's a lot more that can be said about that subject. Again, I'll leave that to uh, the motivated audience. Now we're going to move on to the final piece. Okay. We're doing okay, I guess. Uh, final piece, which is, uh, well, let's see. Can we use these techniques to say something about um, four-dimensional homology spheres? Um, and these are, are, I guess, rational homology spheres. And uh, the question here is which finite groups can arise as fundamental groups of, of four dimensional rational homology spheres? So that's another problem. Now we're one dimension higher, but now you're in the, in the realm of four manifolds. So um, you can apply an analysis similar to the case of rational homology three spheres. So suppose M is a closed orientable 4N manifold. So it might as well take 4N manifolds. Let's go for broke and do, do the case of all, all manifolds of, uh, uh, of um, dimension a multiple of four, just because it's, it's kind of tidy to do it that way. And uh, suppose you have a closed orientable 4, 4N manifold which has finite fundamental group G and a 2N minus one connected universal couple. You know, if you think about that with the um, with the homology spheres, uh, you want the um, when you take a universal cover of a homo rational homology four sphere, then you get rid of uh, of H one, right? So it's going to be um, simply connected. So um, so this is the kind of the version of that for um, higher dimensions. But J X freedom Y preserving orientation. And you can see that uh, that middle uh, homology is a GG module of rank the order of the group times the order characteristic of M minus two. Now you apply the same uh, analysis and you get a short exact sequence in the stable category of uh, this form. Now you have omega minus two N of Z mapped to omega two N plus one of Z 
and the quotient is h to n of y. We already discussed what that means. And uh, we get our uh, long exact sequence out of that. Just keep an eye on the time. Okay. Uh, so what does that give you? Well, now you have uh, the sequence there as before. And you have, uh, hopefully, the no typos here in the, uh, in the uh, indices. Uh, the key thing here is that you have cup product by a class sigma. And now this class sigma is an h minus 4n minus 1 of g, okay? And that is the image of the generator uh, in h0 of g, as before. And once again, you can identify it with the image of the fundamental class under the classifying map. So now it's a 4n dimensional manifold. So you have a map from uh, the homology in degree 4n of m to the homology in degree 4n of bg. And that you identify with h minus 4n minus 1 of g. So you're copying with that. Now, now it's an odd dimensional cohomology class. So that, of course, has, uh, has implications for, um, for the analysis and makes it fundamentally different than the analysis for uh, the three-dimensional uh, manifold. Now, uh, now, what do we have here as, a, as an extension class? Well, uh, the map from omega 2n plus 1 of z to h lower 2n of y gives you an extension class here. So you have this extension class, epsilon y, and now this is an h 2n plus 1 of g with coefficients in h2. Now, uh, this is not, uh, well, you know, it's a higher cohomology, and there's some interpretations of that. So um, this, again, you can take the H0 here and then map it, and you can describe it. So from the point of view of homological algebra, just to, to uh, make people happy, you can describe it uh, something like this. You see here you have uh, the integers. And uh, OK, so you have y. And let's assume y has a nice uh, chain complex. Say, uh, say y has a, it's a GCW complex. Okay? Finite type, you know, everything here is compact and nice, and maybe even smooth, whatever you want. And uh, you have the integers here, and it's it's uh, two n minus one connected. So this is like a resolution, all the way up to here, and then you have this kernel here. Now, for those who, who know, you know that this is omega two n plus one of z. This plus some projectives, kind of a disguised version of that. Now you have the the oh sorry, this is b two n. Then you have these boundaries, they come in, and then you get this extension here. So this is an element in H2n plus one of Z, uh, in X, H2n plus one, X, 2n plus one of Z, Z with coefficients in H2n plus one of Y. That's the class that's represented. So this is like the universal dimension shift, and that's the, like the quotient which is coming. This is like the analog in homological algebra of what we did with the fundamental group. So it's, uh, it's uh, anyway, it's 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 an invariant. So uh, now, um, what do we get in this case? What does our analysis give us? So we have a finite group acting freely on a two n minus one connected orientable four n manifold y, preserving orientation. Then uh, that class epsilon y is different from zero, and uh, the order of the group is equal to the exponent of sigma times the exponent of epsilon y. Uh, the class epsilon y has, epsilon, has exponent the order of the group if and only if sigma is equal to zero, in which case you have a stable equivalence. So again, an isomorphism up to projectives uh, where, where you, it's described completely in terms of omega 2n plus 1 and omega minus 2n minus 1. So why is this? I mean, this is the part which is a little bit different. Well, uh, you have the order of the group is equal to the product of these exponents. But uh, epsilon y is a, uh, sorry, sigma is an odd dimensional class. And it will never have the highest exponent in the, um, in, 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 um, so it'll never be a, um, a, a uh, what's, what's the word? It'll never give you a, um, an invertible class in the cohomology. So this one has to be different from zero. And uh, this class has exponent the order of the group if and only if uh, sigma is equal to zero, in which case you have a stable equivalence. Okay, so that's what's different here. So in other words, this class, uh, this class, uh, sigma is not going to go very far because it's an odd-dimensional class. You know? That's the 
And in particular, if you have a group with periodic cohomology, um, it's always zero in odd dimensions. So uh, the splitting um, holds for those groups. So you have that, that expression of the projectors. So, uh, so that's, that's fundamentally different than what we said before. So um, now what are the problems that motivated this analysis? These are problems that come out of Ian Hamilton's 1980s uh, toolkit. Uh, if G is a finite group with periodic cohomology, can it appear as the fundamental group of a rational homology force field? That's the basic question. And uh, in work with Ian Hamilton, they showed that if G is periodic with period four, then in, in fact, it arises as the fundamental group of a rational homology force. So uh, they saw that in paper back then. So now you want to try to solve this problem in general. It's kind of work in progress, I guess. You know, I don't know, people might work on it. If G is a group of deficiency zero, then you, we can construct a rational homology force sphere with G as its fundamental group. Um, there are many of those examples of finite groups with deficiency zero. So deficiency is uh, you take uh, what the, the generators, number of generators, and you subtract number of relations, and you take the maximal, uh, uh, the, the greatest, um, value of that, I guess. So you talk about the, the, the deficiency of that. So, um, so a metacyclic group with H2 of G is equal to zero has deficiency equal to zero. So this class includes groups with periodic cohomology of arbitrarily high P. So that's something to begin with. It, it, it's an interesting problem to think about. Now, uh, in the final minutes, do I still have time? Or maybe I should stop here. Do you, do you still want me to still go ahead or you're, yeah? I uh, can go on till seven, we usually do one hour. Okay, yeah. so uh, now um, this turns out to be related to some uh, questions about the group homology. So define mu n of g as at least integer greater than or equal to these numbers. Here, uh, m is gonna be a simple fp of g module uh, for prime p dividing the order of the group. You're going to invert its dimension, and then you're going to look at uh, this uh, partial Euler characteristic of the cohomology of G with coefficients in M. So this is an integer, this is a, a, an invariant introduced by Swan in a famous paper from the 60s. At the same time, you can consider the following invariant. Uh, for a finite group G, you let EN of G be the least integer greater than or equal to all the numbers, which are the following. You take HN of G F, and then you subtract two times uh, the uh, partial order characteristic you get in these lower degrees. And here F ranges are all, all prime fields of characteristic dividing the order of the group. Now, if, uh, if, um, you're looking at a P group, then there's only one simple FP module, only one P to worry about, and only one simple FP module, namely the trivial module. So uh, this formula here is just the alternating sum of the cohomology, right? So then these numbers agree. So this number agrees with this number. So the same for P groups, okay? But in general, they can be different. So, um, so we have the following result. If M is a closed foreign manifold with pi n of M equal to G, so a foreign manifold with fundamental group equal to G, and which is, has a two N minus one connected universal cover, then the Euler characteristic of M is greater than or equal to the maximum of these two numbers. U two N of G minus U two N minus one of G and E two N of G. So it's telling you that um, the Euler characteristic has to be, has to have a certain size. So here, for example, for the uninitiated, if you look at the elementary abelian group of rank K, mu two minus mu one, which is the same as the E in this case, you get these, you know, you, you, you'll always get some polynomial with leading term, a, 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 a polynomial, I guess, mu K, power of K, big power of K, they start to grow. So, uh, these other characters are pretty big. So remember the original problem about acting on a, a rational homology sphere 
four sphere. So uh, uh, you can use these techniques to show that um, a finite abelian group that is the fundamental group of a closed four dimensional rational homology sphere can be generated by less than four abelians. Now that, uh, that's a result that goes back to um, uh, Teichner and uh, Hausmann Weinberger using slightly different methods. So, but it's telling you that there's an interesting uh, restriction on the, uh, on the order characteristic of these guys that comes from group cohomology. So um, now, uh, when do you use the, the weird module? So somehow, what our result is saying is that um, you can use uh, cohomology with twisted coefficients. So we all know, those who work on representation theory, module representation theory, know that you can't get away by just looking at the trivial uh, module. When you're away from p-groups, the, these simple modules are, are contributing to the overall uh, cohomology and cohomological nature of, uh, of, of these groups. So the, here's an example. This is a group which is first, uh, uh, this example was first pointed out by, um, it appears in Swan's paper in, in, in one of the points he was trying to make. But now in this setting, we have the following calculation. So you take an elementary abelian group of order z7 to the k and see a cyclic group of order 3 with generator x and let it act on either the k, ek by, uh, uh, you, know, you conjugate each y to y squared and they take the corresponding semi-direct product. Now you can do a computation here to show that u2, mu2 of gk minus mu1 of gk is greater than 2 for all k greater than or equal to 5. And, uh, and we conclude that if you have a four manifold with fundamental group equal to GK, then in fact, two is strictly less than mu two of GK minus mu one of GK, less than or equal to chi of M four. And this two is bigger than equal to E two of GK. So this is an example where the, the E two, you can't use just the invariant with trivial coefficients. So what you conclude from this is that if M is a rational homology four sphere, then K is less than or equal to four. So, uh, so when you have these, uh, these um, complicated twisted groups, the characters which appear in the representation, they play a, a key role in estimating these uh, lower bounds. So, uh, it's, so I think there's, a, there's a, um, some interesting uh, questions here about uh, deciding whether or not a particular group acts, uh, appears as uh, the fundamental group of, uh, of uh, say, a rational homology, uh, four sphere, rational, uh, you know, a, a, a three connected, um, you know, the eight dimensional version, 12 dimensional, there's some interesting questions which arise here. Uh, now, to conclude, so um, Hausmann and Weinberger defined an invariant for four manifolds, which is the, uh, anyway, so, so we know that every group can be realized as the fundamental group of a four manifold. So the question is, um, what's the minimal Euler characteristic of a four manifold that has G as its fundamental group? That's a general question. And of course, for infinite groups, you can imagine there are all sorts of different categories, and et cetera, et cetera. So, and uh, they obtain some estimates, some bounds on this number, which they call Q of G. Now we can look at Q4N of G. Uh, they define this as the smallest order characteristic of a foreign manifold with fundamental group G, which has a 2N minus 1 connected universal cover. And here I'm restricting to G finite, just because uh, I want to say something about it. So now um, you can construct a uh, 4n uh, dimensional manifold with G as that fundamental group, starting out with a skeleton of a cell complex for BG, then taking a thickening and then gluing, doing a doubling construction. And uh, if you're lucky, and I think there's a, there's a few conditions for some groups, but um, it looks like you can get something where the order characteristic is going to be equal to two times mu, mu to n of g. So consider this slide, slight speculation slide. So then uh, you have the following uh, inequalities. 
you have the maximum uh, the mu two n of g minus mu two n minus one of g comma e two n of g uh, less or equal to q four n of g uh, less or equal to two mu two n of g. And uh, if you notice, if when n equal to one, which is the case of the of four manifolds, uh, the analog is the hausmann weiberger estimate. They had two minus two times the deficiency of G, and here you had precisely E2 of G. Now, uh, two, minus two, two minus two times the deficiency of G is precisely uh, two mu two of G. And what, it, uh, and what is different here is that this term with the twistings can give you a better lower bounds for what appears there. So um, anyway, so, th so this is a um, kind of speculation, but the general problem I would refer back to the general, very nice problem that, that uh, Ian and uh, I guess uh, uh, Hamilton and Craig raised. Uh, that's a, that'd be an interesting problem to think about. You have a finite group with periodic cohomology can it appear as a fundamental group of a rational homologist here. How, how do you take care of uh, periods which are not four? So that's a question you might want to consider. And maybe this is a good place to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alejandro. Uh, any questions from the audience? I, I, I have a comment. Uh, oh, there you are. Yeah, hey, you're here. I'm here. Um, so it's you. So you in your offhand comment, one of your offhand comments, you said something wrong. So oh, you I'm said sure. that. Surgery theorists had proven that any finite group can act freely on a rational homology phi sphere. Is it, is it bigger than five? There's some proceedings of the Stanford. In the proceedings no. of the Stanford. No, no, no. Just let me go on. Okay. <laughs> so Schmuel and I proved that in dimension 4k plus one, including five, that a group Finite group can only act freely on a rational homology sphere if and only if um, G is a cyclic group cross a group of odd order. 4K plus three, then your, your comment is correct. But in, for five dimensional manifolds, there's a restriction on the group. They have to be a cyclic two group cross a group of odd order. No, okay. Okay, good. That's good. Great. Thank you very much.